Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. As SALT Talks are a series of digital interviews we've been hosting with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do with the SALT Talk series is replicate the type of experience that we provide at our SALT Conference series, where we try to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as to provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. Uh, and we're very excited today to bring a very topical and relevant uh, SALT Talk to you uh, with Dr. Eric Feigelding. Uh, Dr. Feigelding is an epidemiologist who is one of the, the earliest forecasters of trends that we saw you know, explode relating to COVID-19. He's also a health economist and a senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists in Washington, DC. And he's the chief health economist for MicroClinic International. In January of 2020, uh, uh, Dr. Feigelding was recognized in the media as one of the first to alert the public on the pandemic risk of COVID-19, and he's part of uh, FAS's work to stop COVID misinformation and communication, uh, lead communication with the lay public regarding the virus. He was previously a faculty member and a researcher at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Medical School between 2004 and 2020. Uh, Dr. Feigel Ding's work focuses on the intersection of public health and public policy. He also currently works on behavioral interventions for prevention, Medicare costs, quality improvements, drug safety, diabetes and obesity prevention, and public health programs in the United States. Uh, he has further expertise in designing and conducting randomized trials, systematic reviews, public health programs, public policy implementation, and leveraging big data for improving health systems. He was a, noted in his role as a whistleblower and a leader of a key two-year-long investigation into the controversial drug safety and risk data of Vioxx, Celebrex, and Bextra uh, that drew FDA and national attention. Highlighted and express published in JAMA as corresponding joint first author, he was also recognized for his role in the New York Times and in the book Poison Pills, the untold story of the Vioxx drug scandal. A reminder, if you have any talks or uh, any question uh, for Dr. Feigelding during today's SALT talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And I imagine today will be one where people have a lot of questions about you know, what the future holds for COVID-19, as well as sort of an examination on, on the original outbreak. Uh, and hosting today's interview is going to be Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of uh, Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. See, see, Doc, we have so much respect for you that we dressed up like billionaires, see? I'm wearing my Mark Zuckerberg hoodie, uh, but it's a, a, a source of uh, frustration for me. My only suit out here, my wife has in the dry cleaner, so I, I apologize for the way I'm dressed, but uh, uh, no thank, you for, thank you for coming on. I, I think it's always an important and central question, particularly for the younger people that are listening to our uh, Saw Talks. How? How did you go in this direction with your career? What was the driving factor? Uh, was it an Asian tiger mom? Was it you? You, my, my son is his own internal tiger mom. He just graduated from Stanford Business School. He's like a self-cleaning tiger That's, mom. What was it about you and your family that turned you into this illustrious direction? Well, I was, you know, I was a normal video game playing kid, you know, in high school played way too much video games until I was 18. But uh, I had this big tumor when I was 17 that was the size of a tennis ball, baseball. And they said, you know, you have a five-year diagnosis with this kind of tumor right here. And uh, I thought, um, you know, I was gonna die. And, and they luckily took, took out the tumor and it wasn't uh, uh, that kind of cancer. So, but it kind of woke me up, jolted me up and, Life is short, you know, it's about what you do in life, not the number of video games you can master on Legendary. So, and, right, and that hold, kind hold of- on, I gotta get my awesome. six-year-old kid in here who's playing Fortnite right now somewhere in the house. I gotta get him down here to hear that. But, uh, so you had, you see, this is some, this is why I love asking this question. So you had a traumatic event, a health scare. How old were you, 18? I was 17. They took out the tumor when I was 17, yeah. Okay, and how long did it take you to heal from all of that? Well, it was like it was like an open chest. They cut your rib cage apart, kind of thing. It took a while, but I, I could still run. So I started running a month after the surgery. My mom was like, you know, 
scared pretty living average living daylights that I was gonna fall and crack my rib cage apart again. But um, no, it was good. I, I recovered, but uh, um, couldn't be an astronaut or anything like that that I wanted to be originally be. So, but then it sent me in a different direction. So I went, the, you know, I was really keen on risk and prevention of things. And that took me to Hopkins. I want to be a doctor, but then I realized, you know, I think epidemiology, predicting risk, because I became obsessed with it when uh, I went to college after my health scare. And from there on, epidemiology, what I, I fell in love with. I went to medical school too, but then I dropped out because I did a doctor in epidemiology and another doctor in nutrition. And you know what? Life's about what you do new, not collecting a third doctorate or something like behind your name or anything like that. So, and that's why I became an epidemiologist. Okay, so I, I, I love the philosophy. I'm gonna take you back to January 20th, 2020, which feels like it's seven to 10 years ago now. Uh, you posted a thread on Twitter, which I think got a lot of fanfare, but at that time, people still really didn't know what was going on, myself included. Uh, and it was a pre-publication of a paper on the novel coronavirus, where you said, holy mother of God, the new coronavirus is a 3.8. So what did that mean? Was that the uh, Yeah, that was the r not. That was R-naught, the r not. Okay. And so let's first, tell people, people what the r not is. Some of our viewers yeah, may not the know. The r not is basically, the r not that means the raw R, means for every infected person, that person infects three point eight additional people, you know, in this, you know, in per an day. exponential manner. Per, per transmission. Day. Per transmission. Not per day, but per transmission. That person gives okay. another three point eight, gives another three point eight. And you can see how this thing just cascades out of control exponentially. So and something like the two, Ebola virus, what was the R not on the Ebola virus? The Ebola is it's it's slightly lower, but the thing is it's not just the R not. It's also, for example, the more Ebola fizzles out. Ebola's R naught is a little lower, and it fizzles out because it kills so it kills fifty percent of case fatality. And a virus that grows, you have to spread fast, but not kill everyone along the way too quickly, right? Because if if you do that, then it fizzles out. So this is why this coronavirus, COVID nineteen, is is such a weird in between. It kills those who are susceptible, especially if you're obese and heart, heart disease or underlying factors with a very high rate or hospitalizes them. But then for some young people, it just passes asymptomatically. They don't even know they're sick, but they're <laughs> making everyone around them sick. So this is why it's so pernicious because it's like a double edged, really light and um, spreads really fast, contagious, silently, but then it kills and maims those elderly and have risk factors. So this, this spread, and it tends to super spread. So it either spreads, you know, oftentimes just one or two people, and then other times 60 uh, um, people at a wedding, for example. So we, we know this kind of stuff happens. And in January, when I saw it, the r not, I knew this was bad because it's, it wasn't just the paper. I have relatives in China who've been sharing info with me, and they, you know, basically you piece up together, like, this is bad. But most scientists, you know, I don't work in academia anymore. Most scientists are too shy, too gun shy to say, call it out in a manner that everyone can hear, right? And so I, I had nothing to lose. I was leaving Harvard anyways. And I just said, you know what, I'm gonna go all out and say it's thermonuclear level bad. It's gonna be really, really bad. But you know, back then you might as well tell people about aliens, to be honest, because people don't know what the hell it is. Well, you 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 called it out. Uh, some people listened. A lot of people, frankly, didn't listen. As an example, uh, the next day, uh, South Korea got its first infection. It seemed like they listened, had the right culture to respond to the virus. The United States got its first infection on the same day, January twenty first. Uh, what do you think went wrong in the United States? Yeah, there's a whole boatload of things. You know, someday we're going to have like a, you know, a reckoning of everything. But I think like it's a, a combination. Almost like of, a 9-11 commission, a coronavirus. Yeah, I think there will be. There definitely yeah, will sure. be. 
I believe that. <laughs> Not under the Trump a response, administration. A responsible officer of government will need to do that at some point so that we can learn from it and uh, yeah, and, I and think, figure out what. I think what went wrong is a series of, we didn't react. There's like, people have this tendency to, oh, don't overreact, don't be alarmist. You know, there's, there's this pro-alarmism, an anti-alarmism. And the climate change people have been sounding alarm for a long time, but people don't see it. People need to see it to believe it. Uh, and I think it, people don't want to cause panic because, again, they scare the markets, right? Um, but at the same time, people have a limit of imagination. We haven't seen a pandemic like this in over 100 years. And we don't have a good memory of history. And again, people can't believe something that they haven't seen themselves they don't take it seriously and so when it comes to taking precautions you know people basically not well, we don't have to go that extreme no we don't have to that's too much it's just the, the that gut reaction that's just the first line kind of thing but also you know obviously testing we should have test, tested aggressively it's not just about how much you test but how early and you do it and you contact trace and America is just, you know, we had some t lab testing issues, but we also didn't contact trace, right? We didn't do lockdowns fast enough. We didn't do mask wearing early enough. There's so many things that we went wrong at. And so, but at the, at the very minimum, we did not get, we did not soak in the reality fast enough. All right, so they seem to have done that in Europe. They seem to have done that in parts of Asia. And their economies seem to be more open than our economy. Is, is that fair to say? They are now, but their lockdowns were a lot harsher. Um, you know, Italy lockdowns, you weren't even allowed to go to the park or go outside. In China, Wuhan, the lockdowns were so harsh, you were not even allowed to go outside to go grocery shopping. They would bring the food to your neighborhood little community cluster, and they would like, you know, tie the food to a pulley to pull it up to your third, fourth, sixth floor apartment. It was just that intense and no one was allowed out. And Look. they scanned your cell phone SIM cards to make sure you weren't in the hotspot because sure. you know we don't believe you if you haven't been to Wuhan. You show us yeah. your SIM card. Has it touched a Wuhan SIM card tower? But the thing is we can't do that here. You know, there is a degree of individuality and freedom and it, it's really difficult. And listening to big government you know, half the country doesn't is anti-big governments, but you know, this is what government's for. You know, in times of crisis, coordinating all this kind of things. But you know, I think our society was just ill prepared. We just way too lax a day school. If you actually look at some of the lockdown rules, it's half pages lockdowns, three pages of exemptions, and right. it's 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 completely different what we did. Let's talk about the disease for a second because we got a lot of information on the disease, some disinformation. I have friends of mine like Chris Cuomo that are long haulers. They're having a hard time coming back from the disease 100%. So what is the disease actually doing to the body? Is it a respiratory virus or is it attacking other organs in the body cotemporaneous to the respiratory area yeah. of our body? Tell us about the disease and your observation and what we're learning from the epidemiologists and from the autopsies, frankly. Yeah, the, I think it's already showing that it's clearly more than just a respiratory. It's already have, it has neurological effects because actually, for example, you know, the classic symptom of you losing your smell, it's actually not because the, the, your sensors are dulled. It's actually neurological. It actually, it's because of affecting your nervous system. That's actually why you lose your smell, not because your receptors are malfunctioning. Uh, and similarly, you have a brain fog. There's a lot of people with brain fog long term. So and what is worst, brain fog? I, I miss words. Just, just I, cognitive, you know, memory problems. Hard, not, hard time not doing real math. Dementia, but short term, right. you know, recall, you know, right. these kind of verbal can't um, remember the name or the place that I was yeah, at exactly. or something like that. Yep. Exactly. It's just that memory fog, as people generically call is, it. Is this but, stuff reversible, Doc? I don't know. Like, this is, this is the stuff that we're finding out. We're in a fog of war, literally. Because, you know, here's the other thing. The frustration is normally science is behind the walls. We figure out our, our shit. 
okay, this is true, this is not true. Okay, here's a story. All right, now let's go tell the public. But now people are so hungry that we don't know there's a lot of conflicting stuff and there's a lot of crazy people peddling dangerous theories too. And, you know, hydroxychloroquine uh, and being one of them, um, you know, this other bleach uh, thing and, you know, I can go on. But I, I think reversibility, we'll figure it out. But I think there's other things like heart, you know, we already know heart disease, you know, myocarditis and other inflammation is also clearly well known. And there's actually some new evidence, I hate to tell it, but there's, um, there's it actually affects sperm quality um, for a short period of time at least. Uh, if, if anything, if, any, if, you, if you actually wanna tell people to wear masks and obey social distancing, tell the, the fragile, you know, ego sensitive men who don't want to wear masks, they will actually hurt their sperm quality. Honestly, that would actually get people to uh, wear masks and, and social distance way more than telling it, oh, you'll help other people by protect them, right? I thought college football would be the motivator for people in the South, but that didn't work either. And, and now uh, a lot of places in the country, we have no college well, football. I just let you know, Doc, that worked for me, okay? I'm <laughs> masked up, okay, for the rest <laughs> of the year. Right now. Okay, even though I don't have anybody near me, I just don't want anything to happen to my sperm. So You're I'm, still going, Anthony, huh? You, you yeah, still want more. Yeah, I mean, you know, more, more, more kids. You have a lot of kids. Okay. That's good. I got, I got I a lot of more. kids. I may have a lot of kids coming. We'll just stick with the mask, I think, until the end of this interview. But <laughs> Let, let, let's go to another question related to misinformation. The virus is just going to disappear. The virus is just like the flu. Yeah. And I am going to take the mask off because yeah, I thought that, that, is, that, thought is that was very dramatic. I thought it was, it was having a dramatic No, dramatic is there. what is necessary to get people, you know, I tell people dramatic is what literally you have to shout in a way people can understand, emotionally connect with. Because if you well, just you use me, some scientific me with talk, the sperm. I'll be I'll be wearing a hazmat suit next time I'm in the uh, local supermarket. But but let's go to this information: the flu yeah. and the disappearing. And I mean, what, I mean, no, like the flu. First of all, the, the flu is people don't get the flu shot, uh, uh, the flu test um, normally, right? We impute it from some statistical algorithm, and there's and for this, there's also people are confused. There's two statistics. One, there's uh, case fatality rate uh, with death among those diagnosed. And then there's infection fatality rate. And the infection fatality rate is anywhere from 10 to 20 times uh, uh, the mortality of, um, of the flu. If you actually compare it, it's, it, is, it is so much higher. Um, you know, some people say it's five times, but even if it's five times more than the flu, it's a serious problem. And the other thing is, many of us have some background immunity to the flu. Very few people have any background immunity to this. But there is some argument that if you have the other common cold coronavirus, you have some small immunity, but that is nothing close to herd immunity. They did, I think the herd immunity misinformation right now is one of the, is one of the largest because they say, oh, we don't need to infect you know, 50, 60%, we just need to infect 20%. But still, 20% is, other than Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, most other places aren't even close to 20%. They're not even close to 10%. And so, to, to actual, the number of people being harmed and maimed is so dangerous. And I think that is part of this, right now, you know, Scott Atlas keeps saying herd immunity, herd immunity. It is so dangerous, like Fauci's calling it out. Everyone's in Sweden that tried herd immunity, all their leading scientists basically say, don't do what we did. You know, we're ex ex doing herd as an example of how not to fight a deadly infectious disease. And that misinformation, but is being misused by those who want to reopen businesses and, you know, and pretend everything is normal because look, we've had flare ups, you know, you know, if you look at Israel, Israel had a big peak and then smashed it down. They thought everything's okay. They reopened everything and then everything went out of control. There was no herd immunity there. And it is just so, so dangerous. And I think there's misinformation. People just want to grasp at anything. And 
And I'm reminded of the movie, The American President, in which, you know, uh, Michael J. Fox says to President Shepard, played by Michael Douglas, you know, people are so thirsty for leadership that they will crawl to uh, a mirage. And when they discover it's not there, they'll drink the sand. And Michael Douglas, uh, President Shepard replies, no, people don't drink the sand because they're, they, they're thirsty. They drink the sand because they don't know the difference. And right now, in the middle of the fog of war, there's so much information. They just, people want to drink something to know that they're going to be okay, right? And oftentimes, there's, you know, quacks and snake oil salesmen that's trying to peddle things that's a mirage that's like sand. And science, of course, doesn't give you the instant satisfaction answers. And long story short, people are just misled so easily, so easily right now about this coronavirus. So you have a family. I have a family. John has a family. Uh, kids are going back to school, Eric. Uh, what do you do there? Be our guru, be our therapist, be our epidemiologist, yeah, so be our scientist. Yeah, so first of all, WHO says you should not reopen anything, schools included, until you have less than 5% positivity in your area for 14 consecutive days, consecutive days. And, and I think that's even very kind of like generous because to be honest, you sh we should need to go for zero COVID, but in absence of that being a reality, I think, A, there sh definitely should be a mandatory mask wearing. Man the indoor distancing does not, it's not that important, I think, in the grand scheme, because we know there is aerosol transmission. Aerosol transmission compared to droplets, you know, there's three kinds of transmission. There's fomite, which means surface contact, touch a dirty doorknob, touch your face. There is droplets, as in when you spit, you know, the, the ballistic droplet falls down by gravity within six feet. That's where the six feet rule comes from. But aerosols float in the air. They float literally um, throughout the whole room, um, however big the room is. There's evidence in Netherlands it's gone through some air conditioning ducts that, that recycle the air. And it can be there for 20 minutes to four hours. So I think ventilation is so key. Masking, ventilation, and if you can't ventilate, at least six exchanges per hour, which is once every 10 minutes. Um, not many places have that kind of ventilation. Then you need to use filtration. And if you can't use filtration, you should also add UV in the HVAC system to, to kill the germs whenever you recycle the air. But I think, but those problems are a lot of our schools are outdated. They can't open the windows. And they actually, they can't open their windows and doors because the school's anti-shooting security system prevents it. Sure. Right? And which is very double sad with all the gun violence. Um, and some classrooms are inner classrooms. But the thing is, most schools are poorly ventilated. So it's one of those things where you have to demand, as a PTA, you know, buy filter air, you know, HEPA and MERV 13 air filters if you can't ventilate your classrooms. And, you know, kids should definitely wear masks and maybe face shields too, to be extra conservative. It's all about your degree of risk acceptance, right? But, but what's not acceptable is just sending your kid without a mask. And it's, it's really frustrating. It's, it's all depending on how, how much is the community spread are the schools taking safeguards? Are they ventilating? If they're not ventilating, are you filtering the air or des desanitizing it in some way? But not on, to be honest, not many schools have that or funding from parents groups who can fund all that kind of stuff. Are, are the planes safe? A little bit smaller than a school. <sighs> planes have good air turnover. They do. I, I will say that. Um, but you know, they have exchanges once every six minutes, eight minutes. But the problem is you're in a tight, you're super packed in there, right? You're like elbow to elbow. I'm like six foot. So my, I have really wide shoulders. Don't, don't, and you're don't, like don't rub, in. don't rub it in, Eric, that you're six foot. Okay, uh, uh, all right, sorry. But we're, we're all, anyways, we're all, I hate we're all the same height when we're, 
We're all the same height when we're sitting down. Okay, everybody, take it easy. Okay, go ahead. No. Hey, Fauci. Fauci is, you know, uh, Fauci's uh, my man. He's 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 the man. He's not tall. It's yeah. it's height. Height is not uh, the ultimate measure in these day and age. Um, but like I'm just saying, like if you're packed in there, the the ch- and people eat and drink. And, you know, Ted Cruz has taken off his mask. Many people to take off their masks to eat and drink on airplanes. And there's actually an airplane, a, a documented case in a medical journal. Someone was wearing masks, but he took his mask off to eat and got infected during that time by people around him who were positive. And he wasn't positive and didn't travel to any other places, but he took his mask off next to them. Boom, he got infected. And so I think... I think the airplanes, you know, certain airlines actually block the middle seat. I really respect Southwest and Delta and JetBlue who actually block their middle seats. Or Southwest selling only two thirds of total seats, which is the same. But like United and American, they're not blocking the middle seat. And you know, when you're jammed in there and you're snacking, you're, you're, you're gonna spread because this virus, it spreads more if you shout. But this virus will spread when you even breathe. That's the, that's the honest, scary thing. And just the act of breathing gives out aerosols. And, and again, masks, cloth masks are good for catching yours. But if other people are breathing out while eating, then you're going to get it, even if you're wearing a cloth mask. That's why you should also wear a premium mask. But this is why also airplanes are, fly the airlines are not booking the middle seats. All right. This has uh, been terrific. I'm going to ask you one more question. And I'm going to turn it over to John for our outside uh, questions, our audience participation. Let's talk about the vaccine for a second. Uh, the stories about a vaccine coming in the fall, is that realistic or is that hype? The vaccine, it will, so we will get trial results of some phase threes are finishing. But what I'm worried is that there's, they, they couldn't, they're going to get an interim peak at the uh, trial halfway through before they finish. Because you have to enroll enough people and follow them up for enough amount of time. But they're going to get an interim peak, I bet. And my fear is they're going to emergency use authorize it way too early. Because if you want to truly know whether it's safe and effective, you need to have enough people studied for long enough follow-up time. And I bet, and my worry is that they're, before the election, they're gonna do this interim peak and then they're gonna, they're gonna approve it uh, based on some early data. Because it's, you have to, first of all, just aside from the safety, efficacy, it needs to be at least 50% effective. And you have to be sure enough, because you know every stat has a confidence interval, you have to be 95% sure enough that it's not ineffective, not like 30%, which is crap for a vaccine. So you have to like be sure enough. But the thing is, I bet there is going to be a push to approve it, just like hydroxychloroquine was approved, convalescent plasma was approved, remdesivir was approved for wide use, even though their trial wasn't for wild, wide use. They're going to push it through. And I, I think that's that's careless and callous and because if anything vaccines you know you want to convince people to take it right but if you push it through you're going to actually scare more people and scare them off of using it even when eventually you have all the data to say it's good because the fact that you you know communications is really important if you if you do something too early people get too scared so even when you do it properly later they don't trust you anymore right and that is my worry. Like we will get a vaccine, I'm sure, but hopefully in due time after the phase three trials are done. But my worry is we're gonna get, get it a pre-approved, emergency approved before it's over and it's, it's gonna create a, a shit show. All right, well, I think it's a, I would really appreciate the clarity uh, and the factual basis of all the information, Eric. Uh, doctor, thank you. Uh, let me turn it over to John Darcy. I got a bunch of questions here from from emails and people posting in the chat. So I think we'll uh, we'll pack our 
our last 15 minutes here. And Dr. Feigelding, thanks again for joining us. This is very timely and, and our audience is enjoying it a lot. Um, so the first question is about the World Health Organization. Obviously, you know, Donald Trump is not the first person to criticize the WHO. They didn't get a lot of things. Well, they got a few things wrong in the early part of the pandemic. And, and there's a lot of people that have criticized their, their early response to the pandemic, but is pulling out of the WHO the answer? And in a post WHO world, let's say Donald Trump wins again and serves another four years, or we're trying to rebuild another supranational organization to help us combat global pandemics and other public health issues, you know, were they right to question the WHO and pull out of the WHO? I think I know the answer to that question, but what can we do globally to sort of create a cohesive plan for preventing this type of calamity again that's had so much economic and, and social negative impact? Yeah. So first of all, I think WHO is an organization that is completely built around trying to help global health. Okay. It's, and what's, but what people forget is these viruses, they come from, Ebola comes from Africa. MERS came from the Middle East. Um, you know, there's many viruses that emerge, could emerge from anywhere. And it's WHO that makes sure that they extinguish it in the far nether reaches of where oftentimes these outbreaks start. And nine out of 10 times you haven't heard of guinea worms or many, or polio, uh, be, and they, they crop up every once in a while because WHO keeps them in check. And if they didn't keep it in check, they would be on your neighborhood uh, door, honestly. And, but people don't see that, right? Um, because people, you know, it's kind of like if you build a crosswalk at this dangerous, uh, you know, intersection and instead of 10 people dying a year and being run over, no one dies, no one's grateful for the crosswalk being there. But WHO is like that. And of course, when they make a blunder, it's very visible. But the 99% of the time in which they actually make sure that Ebola doesn't reach your shores and TB is not, is, you're not coughing up TB, is because they kept it in check in the far nether reaches of Africa or India or South America. And that's why we don't have Zika, um, Zika brain damaged babies here in the US when we could have easily had it a few years ago. So I think WHO serves a great purpose. Their comms can definitely be improved. And there's a working group to actually reform WHO because there's de definitely going to be a reckoning. But pulling out from it is so dumb because if you want to change it, and this is a UN organization that is definitely staying around, it's not going to die out. If you, you need a seat at the table. And this is why I'm saying oftentimes, even with people you disagree with, if you want to change them, you need to engage with them and have a seat at that table with someone you disagree with. And I think the U.S. pulling out is stupid. And also just yesterday, they pulled out from uh, WHO's uh, COVAX vaccine consortium because WHO is working on a whole slew of uh, another dozen or two vaccines. And while U.S. is only committed to like a couple, like half a dozen in warp speed. But it's kind of like an insurance project. If you don't want to join the vaccine group organized the WHO, you're putting all our eggs on our limited number of vaccines, right? It's a risk. Like during a pandemic, you want to actually get insurance. So I think joining A, pulling out WHO and B, refusing to join the WHO vaccine consortium to share other resources of working vaccines is just stupid in the long run. And you, you alluded to this earlier when you were talking about using the, the sperm example as a way to clearly communicate something visceral to an audience that might not take the virus as seriously. Uh, as they would otherwise if they heard an example like it reduces your sperm count or the quality of your sperm. You know, there seems to be a rise in misinformation and, you know, anti-vax movements and things like that. I think there was a poll that I saw a couple of months ago that nearly 30% of the population is at least vaccine skeptical, if not anti-vax. Why do you think that is creeping up as part of sort of American culture where we're rejecting science? And how do we come up with an information campaign to combat you know, the, the misinformation that's causing public health issues, frankly? You're seeing an increase in diseases that were dormant for yeah. many years because of you know, anti-vax movements. Yeah, the anti-vax movement is very tricky. It's, it's a confluence of different things. Like I've studied it over the years. It's partly a distrust of big pharma, right? Because pharma has 
jacked up the price of insulin. You're familiar uh, with that, of uh, course. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, of, you know, selling, peddling dangerous drugs, opioid epidemic, uh, jacking up the price of EpiPens for kids with allergies. So that, A, that feeds into all this. They're all tied because it's this distrust of big pharma. Um, and secondly, um, the, the anti-vaxxer movement, you know, it also feeds on this this globalist, anti-globalist conspiracy, like Q, for example, there's a poll that came out, only 13% of Republicans don't believe in Q. That's crazy. That's the, the fact that there's 87% of Republicans believe in uh, QAnon conspiracies is just mind blowing. But it's just part of that same distrust of the machine, whatever they, it's, even, even though science does not care, the virus does not care about your political beliefs or your religious beliefs. But there is this movement to be anti-science because for some reason science is part of the establishment. And I think that's very hurtful. Uh, and I think this vaccine will actually show us, you know, if we do not get vaccination, because you know, herd immunity does work if you vaccinate. It's the only vaccine is the only safe way to get to herd immunity. But if we don't get you know, say the vaccine is only 60 or 70 percent effective, and then only um, you know a th two thirds of people take it, then you're there, you're going to drop below 50 percent potentially, and that's going to be really bad because if many people don't take it, uh, then this epidemic will just keep raging onwards, and we're going to pay a way way higher price because we need to extinguish it before we can actually truly get back to normal. What would deaths in the United States have looked like if we said, you know what, we're going to take a full herd immunity approach and we're going to actively infect members of the population so that we can reopen the economy? What would the death count have looked like in your estimation? It would potentially be in the millions, honestly, in the millions. Because here's the thing, uh, there's, you know, elderly is a, is a risk factor, but I think another major risk factor is, you know, obesity. And, and um, especially among the sphere morbidly obese you know, there's almost no one who gets hospitalized with morbid obesity doesn't go on a ventilator. That's, and that's just that scary. Um, and so it's, it's tons of diabetes is a risk factor, heart disease risk factor, you know, so many kidney diseases are also risk factors. In addition to being immunocompromised, the actual number of people, and then that's just deaths and hospitalization. And then there's people, there's long COVID who are being maimed with long-term mental, you know, the brain fog, mental scarring, as well as other diseases. I think, I think that, that total, you know, it's not just mortality, but also long-term morbidity that's actually causing the, that, the, 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 that herd immunity will be extremely, extremely dangerous at. And this is why, like when Joni Ernst yesterday, she peddled two conspiracy theories in a row, one about herd and then the 6% thing. Uh, and the other thing about doctors are overbilling just to make money from it. It's insane. You know, by the way, 6% thing, basically saying only 6% of people who died did not have any risk factors. But that's kind of like saying, look, hey, there is a meteor that's going to drop on this town. 94% of this town has some sort of risk factors, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, et cetera. But when the, when the meteor crashes down, it, you know, it wasn't the meteor that killed them. It was right. the risk factors. You know, well, something only... like forty percent of Americans have two or more chronic diseases. Oh yeah, isn't exactly. that right? Two thirds of Americans have uh, major uh, risk factors, and that's excluding age. If you include age, you're you're getting close to 80, 90 percent. You know, and so this is why it's so so dangerous. And again, most cancer patients, ninety five percent of cancer patients, who who are near death have risk factors. So does it mean that 95% of cancer deaths are fake because they have other risk factors? No, it was the cancer. So I think all that conspiracy theory is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And if we have sitting members of Congress like Iowa Senator Joni Ernst peddling it, it's just, it's ludicrous. And Iowa right now, by the way, is having the, one of the worst epidemics. Their mortality is soaring. Their cases per capita is one of the highest uh, in the country, I think it's top three right now. It's just, you know, these, this is why these conspiracy theories are dangerous because it tells people to be complacent. They're going to keep spreading it. Maybe a young person catches it at the beginning or a kid or at school, 
but you know what they're going to spread it to mommy and daddy or grandparents again eight or nine out of you know 10 people actually have risk factors and you can't quarantine a kid from the rest of the family that just doesn't work right so that's why it's incredibly dangerous what about reinfection so it's still sort of uh under dispute about the idea of reinfection there was a patient in hong kong who showed uh, asymptomatic reinfection there was a nevada patient who ended up in the hospital uh, when his first infection was far more mild. Are people getting reinfected? You know, what's the early data on that? And how does that impact what the long-term benefits of the vaccine will be? Yeah, so th these are good two separate questions. First of all, about the reinfection, we've known about it's possible for a while, but you know, from anecdotal reports, but to prove it, you needed to actually have this Hong Kong and Reno, Nevada example in which they had a sample of the original virus and a sample of the new virus, and they compared the, the, the genome, the RNA of the virus, and the R virus are completely different. So that we know that, for example, that it's a different virus as, as opposed to the virus just being dormant in your body. Um, and you know, as you pointed out, the Hong Kong one was, the second infection was asymptomatic, but the Reno one, the second time the guy got infected, he got hospitalized you know, for quite a while. So we don't know how common it is because it's really hard to do this double virus genome DNA, RNA test. But um, it's definitely possible, but I think it's probably not the case most of the time. Most of the time, most of the people do have uh, some sort of immunity um, or crossover immunity. You know, just like people, like if you were previously infected by a common cold coronavirus type, you have partial immunity to, to this. But it's not, it shows that it's not guaranteed, right? And this is why, you know, I think for the vaccine, though, it's not a likely worry because the vaccine targets, there's different versions. This is why we need to pool vaccines because there's not just one single vaccine. There's right. some that's attenuated uh, or, or actually inactivated. Some, they put it into the NRNA, put it into um another virus particle to carry it and then basically they want you to learn it's like a it's a virus training program that's what a vac vaccine is and there's different training programs to train your body so i think this is why we need even if one vaccine is less than perfect say it's you know the measles vaccine is great 98 percent, but most vaccines oftentimes are less than 98 percent. even if it's not perfect we need to put our eggs in more baskets this reinfection thing just teaches us this vaccine could be better short term, this vaccine could be better long term. And why, this is why we, you know, not joining the WHO vaccine consortium, which has way more vaccines in the consortium than our warp speed program, is kind of stupid. We need to actually consider and try all the different vaccines to see which one is the best long term. And hopefully, you know, th this virus is not a fast mutator. It's not like the flu. The flu is, has this uh, fast recombination system. This one, has, it's, it's slow mutator. So we're hopeful that it will have lasting effects, but we need to put our eggs in more baskets, as any investor would know. So I want to talk about Sweden for a minute uh, before we wrap up. We've had a few questions about that, and there's been a lot of, you know, hand-wringing over the Sweden approach, which is, you know, to allow more free movement in the economy, keep the economy relatively open. But as you alluded to earlier, Sweden has, has suffered similar health problems, if not worse, than neighboring countries and other countries around the world. And they also have not been immune to the economic impacts of the virus, which sort of goes to show that the slump in the economy is not a, a matter of the economy being closed. It's a matter of people not wanting to go out yeah. when they could be potentially infected by a deadly disease. Could you talk more about the, you know, exactly what the results are of that experiment were in Sweden and, uh, and what we learned from that? Yeah, well, the Swedish experiment is not a scientific experiment. It's more like a social, right. hey, lazy, laissez-faire policy. Sweden, if you look at the curves, had enormous, enormous infection. And Sweden used to be the same country as Norway, by the way. They split uh, decades ago. But if you look at Swedish versus Finland, to the east, Norway to the west, Denmark to the direct south on a bridge, all its Nordic Scandinavian neighbors did exponentially better. Uh, in terms of cases and mortality. Swedish mortality is finally going down a little bit, but it's, it's been really, really bad and uh, uh, cumulative much worse. And their economy is actually no better, no better. And again, you are right, it's, 
it's the demand. It's not that it's not the business closing per se. It's that people are scared. And this is why the best analogy is Jurassic Park. If you, you know, if you reopen Jurassic Park with velociraptors still roaming around, people are not wanting to come back to Jurassic Park. Even if you say the park is open, we have tasers. No, just because you have tasers and we have distancing masks and shields, people are not going to come to your park. And that's the underlying thing. Until we get this under control, the demand is not going to come back. And demand is not just like, you know, cash demand in terms of, you know, uh, you know, cash on hand and the marginal propensity to, to consume on a macro scale. It's the, it's the micro demand uh, because there's just people are scared to go out in here. And, and in terms of Sweden, in terms of like herd immunity, you know, I don't think it's truly reached herd immunity. You also can't compare Sweden to the U.S. Sweden has universal health care. You have right. any illness, you do not have to pay a cent, basically. It's, yes, they have taxes, but in terms of on an everyday out-of-pocket cost, you pay almost nothing. And they have perfect you know, contact tracing. Uh, they have medical record system that's all linked. It's it's a completely ability to socialize system than yeah, their ability the to US. socialize the costs, uh, you know, the, the healthcare costs. Yeah, uh, of the pandemic here people are dying right. because yeah. you know they can't even afford a test, uh, right? You know, and, and, people, and it's been said that you know Trump tries to say and others try to say that we're overcounting the number of deaths from COVID, but there's a lot of suggestion that we're actually severely undercounting because of uh, home. Oh, deaths. we're undercounting and, by ten x. We're, right. we're the, all the studies show the true infection is actually 10x higher than what our case count right now is. And we, we just passed 6 million just a couple of days ago. Um, we're gonna definitely pass 7 million um, this month and we're definitely gonna pass 8 million in October. So by election day, we're gonna have at least 8 million. I'm pretty sure about, about that. And 8 That's million identified, the US not population, just 8 million, yeah. multiply it by 10. So yeah, if, you, if you're looking at the US population, you're, you're thinking a quarter of the US population has probably been infected with the virus. But, but by by end of the year, yes. Yes. Um, but still, you know, that is herd immune. That's not quite herd immunity levels. Right. You know, and, and again, it doesn't truly kick in until you're way higher. Look, this there is there is no easy way out. People are trying to dream up fanciful ways like Sweden as a fanciful way to get out of this. There is no magic bullet. It's about it's the Velociraptor Jurassic Park example. Demand is not going to truly come back until all this is solved. Conferences, you know, these businesses are not going to hold these global in-person massive business conferences where everyone's rubbing elbows and shaking hands because the risk is, is, is too high, right? And that is what's the underlying problem. And until actually we feel the risk is low enough, all the normal businesses and uh, exchanges and business meetings are not going to happen. And I think that is the ultimate lesson. Like, this is why chasing zero COVID is the best way. And, and, and there's ways to do that without lockdowns now by ventilation, right? Mask wearing and premium masks. Because cloth masks are good for catching your droplets, but the premium masks like surgical N95, KN95s are way better actually filtering out these, especially if a lot of people don't wear masks. You see, the less people wear masks, the more you need to wear premium masks if you're surrounded by people who don't wear masks. Right, because double masking, things like that. Yeah, only the premium mask protects you from them if a lot of people around you don't wear masks. But we should have had like a Defense Production Act for that months ago. But right. here we are, we don't. And so it just came out in the last, I think, couple hours that the CDC is asking states to speed approvals of, of their vaccine sites so they're ready by November 1st. You think that's a politically driven decision and it's not a coincidence that... It's, two it's days not a coincidence. The election. Look, the, we know the, Oct the October surprise is the least surprising of any October surprise. The, the surprise everyone talks about is that basically Trump will force his FDA uh, to emergency approve uh, the probably, probably the, 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 um, the Moderna one or maybe one of the other ones. But they're going to uh, force approve whichever one they have the most data for, right? and they're gonna hail its success, but no one's gonna actually get a sh an actual vaccine shot by them because our production's on a catch up. And it only right. go to healthcare workers at the beginning anyways. So 
I, I don't think we're getting an actual vaccine until spring of next year to be er at the earliest. And at the very beginning, there's going to be shortages. So this, this October surprise, it's coming. And they're going to force a vaccine through. And it's going to, A, it's going to empower the anti-vaxxers, right? They're going to say, right. oh, we don't have all Which the data. We don't know if it's safe. Because it's, because, you know, the scientists will actually say, we don't actually have all the data or that we need to fully evaluate it. And it's, it's going to empower anti-vaxxers. So in the long run, we're actually going to hurt ourselves because we're going to lose credibility. By we, I mean, as a country, CDC, FDA is going to lose credibility whenever the oh, FDA or emergency approves this. And it's, it's going to be a shit show. This is what I'm really, really concerned because this vaccine rollout, I guarantee you, we're not going to be talking about herd immunity um, or the hydroxychloroquine in, when October, November comes. It's going to be this rushed vaccine. Right. And, uh, and again, it's only going to empower the, the conspiracy theorists. And, and I hate to say it, but unless we can stop it we're, and can actually roll out the vaccine in a safe way, uh, once all the data comes in, basically until Fauci says it's okay, you know, we're going to lose our credibility if we rush it ahead of Fauci. What would Fauci do? I'm going to get the wristband printed up and, and sent out, or, or what would Dr. Feigl do? do? You know, yeah. you we should have those Fauci. shirts. We're, Fauci would wait for the phase three trial to run its course, because every trial is like posted on clinicaltrials.gov. Run its course of however many people enroll do it for the entire amount of time that you requ required and make sure that we have enough confidence that the efficacy is high enough that, you know it's not just like oh we're 50 percent but with like 20 to 80 percent un uncertainty uh, that we're certain about the efficacy and we're certain that the safety signals clearly show there's no uh increased risk then fauci would approve it but that will probably that data is not going to arrive till December or January, the, right. pr the proper way. So. All right. Well, fascinating it. stuff. Thanks for taking sort of an extra 10 minutes. We went over time, but we had a lot of important things to talk about. So thanks so much for taking time out of your busy sure. schedule. I know you've been you know, one of the leaders in combating the misinformation that's been out there. And, and your Twitter feed is an amazing resource in and of itself uh, for following you know, information on the pandemic. So thanks so much for everything you're doing. Anthony, do you have a final word for Dr. Feigelding? No, I just just for our general population, you know, wear on all seriousness, wear the mask, keep your family safe, listen to the scientists and listen to the facts, and we'll all be safer and healthier. Doc, thanks so much. Hopefully, we can have you back at the end of the year and and talk a little more about where you think things are going to set up for 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 twenty twenty one. Sure, absolutely. Stay safe, everyone. Wish you all the best.